Welcome to Profit Boss Radio, where successful women have paved the road to their own financial freedom. Each week, your host, Hillary Hendershot, financial coach, money mindset expert, and experienced wealth manager, will help you discover the keys to the wealth and peace of mind you want and deserve in her no-nonsense and authentic style, starting right now. Welcome to episode 63 of Profit Boss Radio. I'm your host, Hillary Hendershot. Today's episode is called What You Should Know About Your Parents' Money and How to Ask. It is an interview with Aaron Lowry, also known as the Broke Millennial, who blogs at brokemillennial.com. I met Aaron in a few months ago in New York City. She and I both attended a private coaching event hosted by Farnoosh Tarabi, the host of So Money Podcast. And Aaron and I are in kind of the same industry. She's a financial blogger. And I was impressed with her right away. And I saw that one of the articles she had written was about how to talk with your parents about money. And I think that this is a critical topic. So I invited her on the show. And, you know, the conversation really goes both ways. I would love it if parents were open about their money with kids and if kids were open to asking about their parents' money and and if families could really just be more say vulnerable in that sense with each other, although it's not really vulnerability, really money is just business. So, and the less your kids know as you approach sort of the time in life when you're going to be needing people to maybe help you make decisions or take care of your health care and things like that, the less they know, the more disempowered they are to actually do what needs to be done. And I've seen in my practice really just a lot of questions and pain and suffering and frustration on the part of kids who are are left out in the dark when it comes to their parents' financial situation. So I'm excited about our interview. I want to talk to you about a few things first. I was Googling around to see what's already published on this subject, and I found an article on the New York Times published in January of 2015 called Why You Should Tell Your Children How Much You Make. And it starts, the article starts with a story about a gentleman named Scott. Scott Parker, who wanted his six kids to know about the value of money. So he went to his local Wells Fargo branch and he asked to withdraw his entire monthly salary in cash in singles. So it took a full day, apparently, for the bank to get together enough dollar bills so that he could take $10,000 home to his kids. And he walks in the house with $10,000 in cash in bags. Okay. And this is a quote from his son. It said, it looked like my dad had robbed a bank and he set the money down on the table and said to them, this is how much money I earn in a month. And then he showed them, physically showed them what it's like to set money aside for taxes, to pay the bills, to tithe to their church, to make the big house payment, and then showed them how much was left after all of those expenses that cover, you know, their life. And And I just was really sort of enamored of this idea that you could, as a parent, make, you know, cash management and financial planning, personal financial planning real for your kids by showing it to them in dollar bills. I mean, this sort of surmounts that problem. People like to say, oh, you know, digital dollars aren't real. They're, they're, we can't really wrap our brains around them. It's you just plunk down the credit card and, and the money goes out and it's too easy. Money shouldn't be that easy to spend. And I think this is a great way to cure that and really help your kids get the value of a dollar and the process of being a responsible adult. I also found this article called 10 Things You Should Know About Your Parents' Finances, which I'll read you the 10 things. And I think that this is a pretty good list in a perfect world where people were transparent and really willing to share. But as Aaron and I talk about in our interview, it's not always that way. So here's the 10 financial questions to ask your parent. Number one, have they named a durable power of attorney to manage their finances? So I kind of disagree that this is one of the most important questions. I've been in this industry for 17 years and I've never seen a situation where a child or a person had named as their durable power of attorney had to take over. It does happen. And that essentially is you're mentally incapacitated or your parents are mentally incapacitated, unable to make decisions on your own. 
And so someone needs to make those for you and you need to have appointed someone who you trust to make decisions in your interests and along the lines of what you wanted. I'm kind of flipping back and forth between the you and the they pronouns. So sorry about that, because sometimes I think from the position of the older parent, and sometimes I think from the position of the younger or child in this example. But, you know, you have to actually go to court and prove that someone is incapacitated. It's a long process. And in my opinion, rarely happens. But it would be good to know who your parents would like to be responsible for their money in the event that something happens to them or their health declines. Question number two out of 10. Where do they keep their financial records? Yes, absolutely. You want to know this. Responsible people either do it online in a a secure portal or they have like a binder or it's somewhere in a safe. Definitely shouldn't be under the mattress. And you need the keys, codes, passwords, all of that. Question number three, what are their bank account numbers and the names of their financial institutions? You know, it would be great if they would just give you the passwords to their online banking at some point, but truly, you don't really need the bank account numbers. I guess bank statements would help, but if you walk into a bank and something's happened with your parents, first of all, just having the bank account numbers isn't really going to help if you don't have any access to the account or legal ability to talk to the account, your parents need to appoint you on the account. But you really don't need to be able to... It's rare that someone needs to take over their parents' bank account. Question number four, what are your parents' monthly expenses? Uh, Yeah, definitely. That's a good thing to know. You want to know where they pay their mortgage to? How much is that? Do they have a car payment? What credit cards do they have? Do the Uh, statements come in the mail or are they paper form? Where do they receive their bills? Things like that. Question number five, how do they pay their bills currently? Yeah, you should know. Do they use online banking? Do they pay by check? Question number six, where does their money come from? Are they receiving a monthly pension? Do they get income from their investments? Do they get money for a disability or alimony? These would all be good things to know. Question number seven, do they receive Medicare, Medicaid, or Social Security? Definitely want to know the answers to those things. Question number eight, what kind of medical health insurance do they have in addition to Medicare? Great to know. Question number nine, do they have long-term care insurance? Yeah, that's definitely a need to know because if they go into a long-term care facility and you need to file a claim on their long-term care insurance policy, you will need access to that policy so that the insurance company can pay instead of you. It'd be terrible if they incurred the expense of an insurance policy and then didn't get to use it. Question number 10, do they have an accountant or financial planner? Who is that and how do you contact them? And have they done any estate planning? It's funny that have they done any estate planning is just sort of thrown in there with do they have an accountant or financial planner? I would make that its own topic, actually. I personally know the kids of many of my clients and vice versa. I know the parents of many of my clients. So I make it my business to know who to contact should something happen. And that has definitely served me and my clients well. And so you should know your parent's financial advisor. If you're the parent, introduce your children or your heirs to your financial planner. And then have they done any estate planning? Do they have a revocable living trust? You want to understand what's going to happen with their money as things move forward. If one parent were to die or if both were to die at the same time, are you the trustee? Do you need to make decisions? Where does the money end up? Things like that. Okay, before I go ahead and launch the episode, I just wanted to share with you a little bit of what's happening in my life. If you're in the Facebook group, you already know this, but basically as I record this, it's March 27th, 2017, and last week my husband and I got notice that our landlords are selling our home. And, you know, being long-term renters has served us from a tax perspective as entrepreneurs who are able to deduct a large portion of the cost of the rent. And I've talked about that publicly. And I have said publicly a lot, very emphatically, that I don't think that home ownership has to be the American dream. I just, I really want people to know that they don't have to own a home to be financially successful. And especially here where I'm from in Silicon Valley, home ownership is really high bar. I mean, you know, a million dollars hardly buys you a home that's, you know, more than three bedrooms. There's a tract homes, you know, it's just, it's a very expensive area. So now Robert and I are in a situation where we have 
about four weeks to vacate our home. They did give us a 60-day notice. We had worked that into the contract. If you do rent, I definitely would demand a 60-day notice clause. It's almost impossible to move in 30 days. But now we have 60 days, but we also have a vacation planned at the beginning of May. And so it's just been really, really upsetting. I was really sad last week. We did not want to move. I do not want to move right now. And, you know, I thought, well, it's not my nature. Like when things feel tough, I don't, I'm not necessarily moved to share that publicly. I would rather kind of keep things focused on you and and keep providing you value. But I thought, you know, this really is antithetical to everything that I say about this being your wealth mastermind. So I need to share with you just like I'm asking you to share with me and with the community. So I did share that in the Profit Boss group and y'all have been very, very supportive and kind in there. Thank you. And I guess the answer, of course, is to podcast about it. So I'll be sharing with you this journey as we go through getting pre-approved for a mortgage, what that's like. I can talk pretty educatedly about that. There was a time in my career that I was a mortgage lender, so I, I know a lot about that process, but it's still pretty tough as entrepreneurs to get qualified for a mortgage. And I'll be sharing more about that. I'm not going to just make this episode longer by adding a bunch of details on that, but I'll do a solo episode a uh, week after in the next week. So episode 64, and I'll talk a lot about that and give you some insight into that process. And we're going to put an offer in on a home. So I you know, I don't know what to expect in Silicon Valley. It's been a lot of multiple offer situations. I don't love from a negotiating perspective the idea of being in a multiple offer situation, which can really just drive costs up. And so I'm, you know, I'll be honest, I'm not feeling great. It's not, it's really challenging. The part of me that is very future oriented, really want to know where I'm going and where I want to be. And I know I'm, I've been very positive with you on the podcast and I make a point to be very optimistic and really empowering because I want you to know that I, I think anything is possible. I know anything is possible and that I consider to be my role with you. And I have to admit, here I am just freaked out about what's going to happen. I think that where I live is really important to me, the, the space that I'm in, and it really impacts me. And when I go see homes that are listed for more than a million dollars, and I think I don't want to come home to this, it freaks me out that I might end up with no choices. And I'm not saying I have infinite wealth. I don't have infinite wealth, I, but I don't think that money is the limiting factor. In this case, with me and my husband, it's time. And so, you know, I got to have a place to live and it has to happen soon. So it's been a little stressful. I've cleared my calendar a little bit and rescheduled a bunch of things so that I can focus and be at my best. So I'll just be sharing openly with you. And thanks to those of you who are in the Facebook group for being so great with me. All right, here we go. Erin Lowry is a millennial personal finance expert and the founder of BrokeMillennial.com. She's also the author of the forthcoming book, Broke Millennial, How to Stop Scraping By and Get Your Financial Life Together. Lowry has contributed to Forbes, Business Insider, New York's magazine, The Cut, and U.S. News and World Report. Some of her insights have been featured by outlets including CBS Sunday Morning, USA Today, Wall Street Journal, Newsweek, and Marketplace Money. Lowry lives in New York City with her spunky rescue dog, Mosby. I hope it's Mosby and not Mosby, but it's M-O-S-B-Y is the name of her dog. And Erin's just in general a very impressive young woman. So I hope you enjoyed today's show and definitely grab a copy of her book. When you get to a web browser, just go to hillaryhendershot.com forward slash 63 for the link. Erin Lowry of The Broke Millennial, welcome to Profit Boss Radio. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I'm really excited to get your perspective. I, first of all, was completely charmed when I met you in New York City at the Farnoosh event. And I don't know if you remember, but the first, one of the first stories you told us, and I don't even know how it became contextual, but you were telling us how your father raised you around money and how he did a great job. Well, they were good money teachers, but specifically around how he taught you about profits in a business by taking your money from a lemonade stand. Do you remember that? Yes. So that is 
I call that my either like the cornerstone story or like my origin story as if I'm some sort of superhuman. <laughs> you know, Batman, Spider-Man now have origin stories and this is I mine. See. So you tell that story a lot. <laughs> Yes, that is kind of my go-to. It's great at a cocktail party or at any sort of business type function. And it's also how I open my book is sharing that story Ah. as well. Well, the funny thing is, I'll ask you to tell the story in just a second. But the funny thing is, we were in a group of women. I think it was almost all women that you were telling, we were sort of sitting around a round table. And when you said kind of the punchline, what your dad did, which is essentially to teach you about taxation and what profits really are in a business... You know, I said, go dad. And at the same time, I don't know if you noticed, but two or three of the women at the table, their jaws fell and they sort of reached out to you in like a compassion and empathy. Like, how could your dad do that to you? Right. But then they saw, they sort of took our cues that no, that's actually a triumph story or like a good, a good training kind of method. (laughs) Do you kind of get those cross mixed reactions from that story? Yes, very frequently. Wow. And people either think my dad is some sort of Scrooge or Grinch type character, or that he was just incredibly unkind to me as a father, which is could not be further from the truth. And I think that people who constantly kind of inundate themselves with financial stories and knowledge had the similar reaction to you were like, yeah, that's such a good idea. Yeah, yeah, good. Okay, so no further ado, would you tell us the lemonade stand story, Aaron? Sure. And I will try to be a little brief about it because I can go on and on. But basically, it started on a hot summer day in North Carolina in 1996. No, I'll, I'll shorten it. But my mom was having a garage sale. And from a very young age, my parents were talking to me and then also to my little sister, who's three years younger than I am, about money. And so I decided to be industrious and try to figure out how to make my own money. And my mom was, like I said, having this garage sale. So I thought I would try to sell something. And so I asked my dad if he would go and buy Krispy Kreme donuts that could be sold at the yard sale. And he agreed. So he drove there and he was my backer. So he purchased the donuts for me since I didn't have the money to do it myself. And then at the end of the day, when all of them had been sold, he came over and he saw my stack of quarters and he took, he picked up the first stack and said, okay, well, this is how much I spent buying the donuts and your little sister worked for you. So you also need to pay her. So this remainder is your net profit. (laughs) And again, I was about seven. So that was a very startling experience because I thought I was going to get to go buy two super soakers at Toys R Us. And then he took one. And your big almond shaped eyes filled with tears. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And that was really kind of I wouldn't say it was the very first money memory because I do kind of joke about how he would do candy tax at Halloween and he would take candy from us. He got first dibs because he went trick or treating with us. So he said he we owed him just like you owe the federal government. So that set me up nicely for my first real world paycheck. But between candy tax and then the Krispy Kreme situation, by around seven, I was really kind of starting to figure out this whole Money doesn't work quite how I thought maybe it did. People don't just hand it to you. What does this mean? That's funny. And notice how my brain turned it into a lemonade stand when in fact it was a Krispy Kreme donut garage sale. (laughs) And that's pretty, that's always the common, it is a a good lemonade stand story because what do kids typically sell at the side of your street is lemonade. But yes, I decided to differentiate my business and sell Krispy Kreme donuts. I feel like I should interview your dad on how to raise money for your kids. (laughs) He'd be great. Maybe I will. And he actually came up with a line recently. I was actually talking to him over Christmas this past year about all of the stories. And he jokingly calls himself the villain in all of my financial stories because it usually does have something to do with him making me pay half for things, including my college education or other, you know, the Krispy Kreme story where money gets taken out of my hand, candy tax where I'm a baby. And It's interesting because I wanted to kind of go back through it and say, was this deliberate? Did you do all of these things with the foresight of hoping to raise us a certain way? Or was it just kind of as they came along? And he said, no, your mom and I were very deliberate with what we were doing. And the line he used was, we wanted to raise you to be enabled, not entitled. And I thought that that was just such a great way to put it. And especially because we can get into this later if you like, but my little sister and I ended up We moved overseas when we were quite young and we lived around a lot of wealth. And I think that it was important to him that while we were getting a great diversity of experience in terms of culture, socioeconomically, 
it was at the very high end of the spectrum. And so he wanted to make sure that we understood the value of a dollar in a different way that we probably weren't getting from school. That's amazing. And enabled, not entitled is definitely the title of the podcast interview. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to talk a little bit about what it was like to be raised around so much wealth and opulence? Sure. I think for the most part, we didn't know better. And when you're raised in this kind of environment, you really just think that that's normal. And you think that most people are, you know, have access to this amount of money. There were little things along the way that I think both my parents and even the schools we went to tried to help kind of offset that a little bit, like Habitat for Humanities trips, um, charitable opportunities. But at the same time, it's something that you go, you help for a week, you kind of get a little bit of a savior complex almost from it. So arguably, it's not the best way to go about teaching kids about how people at other parts of the world live and people at other ends of the socioeconomic spectrum live. But we also got to see a lot of really destitute poverty in certain countries, you know, around parts of China. We live first in Japan and then in China. And China has a very serious socioeconomic spectrum that's quite unlike a lot of things you would even see here in the States. You know, I've been through what they they really is no other term other than slums in the Philippines. And you see this and it, it does really make you understand trait expressions like first world problems and not to undermine anybody's problems in their life, but it puts it in a different perspective for you. And I think my parents did the best thing that they really did for us was that we were never handed anything. We always had to work for what we wanted, even from them. You know, I mentioned the college education. My parents certainly could have afforded to pay for mine and for my sisters in full, no questions asked. But my dad insisted that we still have to pay for 50%, whether that's out of pocket with loans or whether that was scholarships. And then the other thing is we never saw our parents modeled great behavior in the sense that they were not buying the latest and greatest of anything. I make a joke that the couch that's in their living room is still predates my birth. So it's more than 27 years old. That couch has literally Seriously? followed them around the world. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I think my mom even had it reupholstered at one point just because they like it so much. And she was like, oh, it's cheaper to do this than it is to buy a new one. So, you know, they really taught us how to conserve your wealth, how to grow your wealth, and that you didn't need to be flashy about it and also how to give back. That's something that's very important to my parents. And that's behavior that they modeled for us. Can we back up just a little bit? Can you give people a sense of maybe some of the emblems or tokens of wealth that were around you? Like what was life like? What do you mean when you say I was raised around a lot of money? Sure. Oh, even where to start. (laughs) I mean, did everybody have bodyguards like that? Well, some people did, especially diplomat kids, but more so types of cars that got driven, not by us, by our drivers. Everybody had drivers how many IEs or how much help was in the house in terms of did you have a cook and a maid and a nanny or did you just have one or two? What bags the kids had, the kind of jewelry kids had, the shoes the kids wore. I mean, there were women in my class in high school who were wearing Gucci and Dolce and Gabbana shoes every day, carrying those bags. One girl had a I remember thinking, oh, that's a pretty necklace. And someone else saying like, oh, that's a three carat diamond necklace that she just wears for fun sometimes that her parents got her. So it was seeing, I think, kind of those hallmarkers, but also that this wasn't a keeping up with the Joneses scenario where people were amassing credit card debt or living outside their means. That was within people's means. Oh, sure. And you don't, yeah. you don't run around with that kind of stuff because you're put, your parents are putting it on credit cards. Right. And I think it was knowing that as well. And frankly, a lot of people just were very open talking about money. And I think it, it was very much a, you had it and you were comfortable talking about it situation. And I would say that expats in general are even on the low end are often making well into the six figures when they get sent overseas and then housing and a bunch of other life essentials get subsidized by companies. So you're able to put away a lot of your money as well. So you're generally thinking that most people overseas have a minimum of a couple of million. And can you say a little about what landed your parents in that community? I'm not prying. Oh, sure. Yeah, my dad worked for a lithium company. So he just kind of did a great job of working his way up the ladder in corporate America. 
But what I think he really did that differentiated himself from probably other people he worked with is he studied languages. So when he started going to Japan a lot on business, he started studying Japanese and he just really became a natural fit for who to send over to Japan when it became clear that that's what the company needed. Mm. We were meant to be over there on a three year assignment, ended up in Japan for five and a half years. And then my parents were actually back in the States house shopping, anticipating we were repatriating when my dad got a phone call and said, Oh, never mind, we're moving you to China. Wow. So then they ended up in Shanghai for another five years. So they did a little over 10 years in total in Asia. Amazing. What a way to grow up. Yep. Okay. So speaking of, and I'm just thinking if there's anything else I want to touch on about that. I mean, you seem so down to earth. Do you feel like, I feel like your, your, your dad is currently the unknown, like father of the podcast. So he's the, <laughs> he's raised the best financial kid we know. And you're so down to earth. And yet I can imagine being around. I mean, three carat diamond necklaces in my high school would have impacted me. Do you feel that it impacted you? Did it propel you one way or another? Or are there any scars or or things that are possible because of things you thought and did because of that? I would say I was a bit superficial going into college and in a sense of feeling that you might need certain things as status symbols. I cringe when I think back to a conversation I remember having in high school or in, sorry, in college where somebody was talking about engagement rings and I made a quip about, well, if you spend less than $10,000, it's really not worth having. And that is just such a cringe worthy moment in my mind <laughs> now because I have so autocorrected or overcorrected rather that I don't even want one. So <laughs> it's very different end of the spectrum for me. And I think it was just because I was so used to seeing that and hearing those kind of messages and being told that if you couldn't afford these kind of things, then you had failed in some way. And it wasn't really coming from the home so much as just what I was around a lot of the time. Right. And like I said, my parents, the only time that my parents really spent significant sums that I could point to now and be like, oh yeah, they were spending money was on travel. So they modeled the behavior of spending on memories and experiences over possessions. Mm -hmm. And that's what I do today. So I would say it took me a couple of years to kind of shake myself of the, well, a certain price tag could correlate to success Mm -hmm. and rather learn for myself how to decide what I personally value. Mm -hmm. And if somebody values a $10,000 engagement ring, then that's their value. That's fine. That's fine if that's what they want to spend money on. But I know that's not my value. And how did your father's requirement that you pay half for college inform your choice for college? It made me graduate debt free. And that's because I picked the college where I had scholarship money, not the college that was my number one pick in the draft. Because I picked where I got a little over 50% in scholarship money. So I knew I could come out without debt. And even if that debt had been technically to the bank of mom and dad, we honestly never really got to that point in the conversation. But I have a feeling that they probably would have made me take out a couple of federal loans, but nothing terribly significant. My guess is no more than maybe seven or $10,000. And the rest I would have borrowed from them Mm -hmm. and paid them back at little to no interest. But even the idea of that, kind of made my skin crawl because I had been so debt adverse my entire life and I just wanted to avoid it. And I'd kind of been trained to be debt adverse just by proxy of what I was living in. Right. So as you can imagine, telling an 18 year old child that who had grown up around a lot of money and knew you had a lot of money, there was a lot of door slamming and crying and fits thrown, which I'm definitely not proud of today (laughs) when I think back to how I reacted. But My parents, you know, drew a line in the sand. They stuck by it. Even when I tried to call them out and say, I can't, you can't afford this. This isn't fair. Everybody else in school gets to go where they want, which was true. And yeah, they, they taught me how to value my money early. And I didn't get to go to college where I had planned. I actually had even sent in the deposit for a different university. Really? By the time. Yep. And when we really had this conversation out, my dad goes, I just want you to know, how much debt it was going to be around $80,000 of debt for 50% of that school. And I was like, all right, I'll change my mind. Wow. So I, 
I graduated college debt-free, actually with $10,000 in savings. Did you have a good collegiate experience? It wasn't what I necessarily had wanted going in, but I got a great education. I got a great network and you know, met my boyfriend there, met a lot of good friends there. But in terms of diversity of the school, location of the school, it's still probably not what I would have picked if I went back and did it all again. Yeah. Got it. Well, you certainly are a role model in terms of, you know, I don't have to say to you, so many people have just hamstringing debt. Debilitating really is the word. So proud of you for that. So let's get into kind of the meat of what I really wanted to talk with you about. And I was really excited to find this article on your blog, Broke Millennial. And I know you've written more extensively about it, but this idea of what kids should talk with their parents about, about their parents' financial situation. And the article is titled, Are You Your Parents' Financial Retirement Plan? Yeah. But it contains some really great talking points. So why don't you share with us the bits of any person's financial parents' financial life that you think are important to talk about and why? The big one is retirement. And the reason I titled it, you know, it's a little bit salacious saying, are you your parents' retirement plan? But I think it's a fair point and almost criticism And that's not to say parents shouldn't have helped their children go to college, but I do know a lot of, especially American parents, dipped into their retirement funds to help their kids go to college. And especially if their kids are back living at home, not necessarily earning what they anticipated earning, it's a big problem. Mom and dad might have to stay in the workforce until they literally can't anymore, or the kids might be the ones that are needing to support mom and dad. Now, in some cultures, that's the understood situation that you will take in your mother and father later in life. Generally, in the American culture at large, that's not how we do things. So I think that there needs to be a conversation early on about what's happening. And it needs to happen at least, I would hope, a decade before the kid actually does need to financially support their parents. Because the last thing you want is to have just bought a house and just had a baby or your second baby. And all of a sudden you realize that you have to support mom and dad too. And it's okay if you have to help support your parents, but you need to know how to work that into your financial plan. Yeah. And you have the opportunity to make a choice. Like not everyone wants to do that. That's true as well. Okay. What else? Oh, so I talk a lot about getting financially naked with your partner. I think to a degree, it's an important thing to do with your parents, which is an awkward term to use in terms of speaking with your parents, but you need to know sort of their end of life plans their twilight year desires, whether they would prefer to live with you or if there's a retirement home they have in mind. Mm -hmm. What happens if dad goes first? Is mom prepared? What happens if it's the reverse? Do both parents have an updated will? Do both parents know exactly how to get into and access any accounts, pension funds, retirement plans, investment savings? You know, heaven forbid, if your dad's taken care of it his whole life and your mom's never even thought about it and he hasn't updated his will, What happens if he dies unexpectedly and she doesn't even know where to look, especially if they don't have a financial planner? These things are so stressful. Wills are a big one to me just because people never want to talk about it. But it's one of the important thing, most important things to have updated. Even at 27, I already have one. And my parents know where it is. My boyfriend knows where it is. I've told everybody what my desires are because I... The last thing I want is to cause more grief for anyone. And that's how I would kind of couch it to either parents or parents talking to their kids. Either way, as you say, you know, I I don't want there to be any added stress. I want everything to be transparent now. So you know exactly how to handle everything. Right. Very good. And check beneficiaries. That's the other big one. And people forget to update those. Oh, do you know, I know someone. So someone my mother used to work with got divorced. And so midlife divorce, and then her ex-husband got remarried, was married for a couple years, had kids, died in a car accident. He had forgotten to change the beneficiary on his life insurance policy and his ex-wife, my mom's friend, got the money. And it's not as simple as some would say, oh, she should have just given it to the new mom. It's not that simple. You can't just give that amount of money away. That's a taxable event. 
right? So it's not, I can't just say, oh, no, no, I don't want the money. No, it's mine. (laughs) And so checking, double checking that your beneficiaries are current and up to date is really, really important on things like your IRAs. Even bank accounts can be what's called transfer on death. So instead of going through probate, they will, the balance will go directly to a beneficiary of your choice if you change it to what's called a transfer on death account. So thanks for bringing that up. Also, some parents have trusts. Do your parents have a trust? Yes, my parents do. And do you know who's the trustee of the trust? I do. We actually have an action plan in my family. Not Mm. surprising given everything else I've shared with you already. (laughs) Uh, When my parents moved back to America, one of the first things they did was hired a financial planner. And there is now a action plan of depending on who goes when, who gets informed when, who handles what when. And so it sounds as morbid as my mom sent an email that was like, if dad goes first, here's what I'm doing. Here's what you two can expect. If I go first, here's what dad will do. And you two can expect if we go at the same time, here's who you need to call. Here's who's in charge. Here's how to handle it. Doesn't sound morbid to me. That sounds like I love it. That sounds really (laughs) clean and empowering. And I know for some people listening, it's going to take a bit for you to get there to where Aaron and I are about that conversation. But you have to understand it's either going to happen before you die or your, your heirs have to figure it out after you die. And I'm telling you that the former is so much better for them than the latter. Yep. Okay. And so kids who are listening, you want to talk to your parents about these things and parents who are listening, will you please, please, please sit down and share these things with your kids. And Aaron, what about families where conversations can be tough? How do you think, how would you suggest someone who's a friend of yours um, broach the subject? So whether you're talking- Parents think money is private, right? Right. And I think that no matter whether you're talking to a partner, friends, or your parents- It needs to be tactful. And as soon as things start to get heated, you need to back off. And this conversation could take place several times over the course of months. But as soon as people start yelling at each other, you've lost any productivity. You're not going to make any progress. Just step back, walk away for a little bit. But crying can be okay, right? (laughs) Crying can be okay. It's, it's, you know, it depends, especially if mom or dad is super emotional. But you just want to make sure that everybody's kind of in a healthy space, headspace about it. Yeah, I even would recommend bringing it up early on as kind of to test the waters and just say, Hey, mom and dad, I actually, you know, blame it on me if you want. Say, I was listening to a podcast and heard this woman or I read an article by this woman that recommended and just test the water and see what they say about you asking, could we sit down and talk about your retirement plan or what you plan for at end of life? I just want to make sure I'm in the loop. And at first they could say, don't worry about it. That's the most common answer my friends have gotten, Mm -hmm. especially a couple of them tried to have this conversation after reading my article and all their parents said was, don't worry about it. I would come back a couple weeks later, even a couple of days later and say, I know you said not to worry about it, but it would make me feel better if I understood what was going to happen. And if I knew I wanted to make sure that you're okay, and then I'm not going to have to be stressed when I'm dealing with the grief of you being gone. Something like that usually will hit a nerve, hopefully positively hit a nerve so that your parents are understanding and having empathy. Mm -hmm. And if you're the parent trying to talk to a kid and the kid kind of shuts down the conversation, which could happen, no one likes thinking about this, then I advise doing a similar thing and saying, it'll be so much less stressful. And you might even be able to point to your own experience and say, do you remember when grandma died and how awful that was because she didn't have a will or her will wasn't up to date? Remember how stressful that was for me and your aunts and uncles and use that as an example. And I would just be very gentle. If if everybody drinks wine or likes beer, have some of that just to kind of ease the tensions. And I would also talk through an action plan of what would happen when the time comes in terms of retirement. I would make sure to ask your parents, how much do you expect to need every year once you're retired? Do you have enough to meet those needs or do you think you'll still have to keep working what happens if one of you gets hurt or becomes disabled and can't work, work anymore? What happens if you need long-term care? Do you have long-term care insurance? Or are you expecting one of us to take you in? If you do, is there a child you'd prefer to live with? I mean, these are all questions that are much easier to answer when it's not actually a problem. Mm-hmm. You know, I, gosh, where should I start? So I, I have a client who's 
father recently passed away and he was so closed fisted about money and it, it was a cultural thing. They didn't talk about money. And I can't describe to you the suffering this family has gone through trying to find accounts, literally paper, stock certificates, having to get things transferred in name, accounts that weren't titled to the trust. You know, it's been years and they're still sort of dealing with the fallout and there really wasn't a good articulation of what were his wishes. And I think that's the heartbreaking part. There's the frustration and the not knowing, but then look, you're my parent. You worked all your life for this money and now it's in these accounts and you're gone and I don't know what you want your legacy to be. And, you know, she's having to make decisions about, you know, should she disperse funds to this or that sibling who's, you know, should, should a sibling who's financially not responsible get more than a sibling who is? And it's really just not a, a situation she wants to be in. <clears throat> so that's just kind of an example of, for those of you parents who are thinking, I could never reveal my financial situation to my kids. They're going to find out. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it all like Warren Buffett said, when the tide goes out, you find out who's swimming with no shorts. <laughs> mm-hmm. And unfortunately, it often happens when a parent gets injured and has to go into the hospital. And then, you know, people are scrambling trying to figure these things out. So you've had a very open and sharing and almost analytical experience uh, with your family. Have you coached many friends through this process? And have they been successful? There have been a few. Uh, the other big one is my boyfriend. Mm. And that's one where to add an interesting level of complication for most people, you have to factor your in-laws into this formula as well. And, you know, he and I aren't married yet, but we have been together a very long time. That's certainly on the horizon. And I have been pushing him a little bit to have this conversation because It's not only important for him and his two siblings, but it could be important to our future financial life and whether or not that's something that we need to factor in. And he got the same uh, don't worry about it line when he first brought it up. Slowly but surely, they've been a little bit more open. But interestingly enough, his mom has been most open with me. And I think that that's because one, she knows that I like talking about this. And two, it's almost as if less judgment is going to come from somebody who is in the family, but technically outside the family, because, you know, they, it's a different relationship than you would have with your kids when you're talking about it with in-laws. Right, and it's something less history. that, right. And I, it's something I've noticed in some other families is that it's easier for parents to talk to boyfriends, girlfriends, fiancés, in-laws, because they almost, I, don't, I think they don't feel the judgment quite as much, or it's not quite as emotionally charged. So if you have a partner who has a very strong relationship with your parents, you might consider deploying them into going in and having that conversation as well. Mm -hmm. So what about life insurance? Parents who have young kids should have life insurance. And I don't know at what point do you tell the kids? So what age do you think a kid can or should be before a parent should share this kind of information? So say you have a 13 year old or a 14 year old and you have life insurance, but if you die, it's going to go into a trust. Do you think at what point should parents start sharing this information? That's a great question. And truthfully, I've never really thought about it with teen kids. I know that I knew at around that age that my dad had a life insurance policy and so did my mom, even though my dad at that point was the primary earner, but he had one on my mom because my mom was the primary caregiver. If something were to happen to us, then they would need that money to go into like a a nanny or daycare or, or what have you. I think that the important thing for a kid at 13 or 14 to know is who is the executor of the will. And that's because if something, heaven forbid, happens to both parents at the same time, that kid needs to know who to call Yeah, and who's going to be in charge. And I would even start having that conversation as young as nine or 10 in, in a sense of, you know, m- mom and dad are taking a trip. We're going to Germany, you know, we're going to Germany you know, Uncle Kevin is watching you. But if something happens, you also need to know to call Aunt Sheila because Aunt Sheila knows how to handle everything if something happens to mom and dad. It can be really that simple, but just so in the kid's mind, he or she knows this is the person that has all the answers. So it occurs to me, I imagine, like you said, these conversations with your families can occur iteratively, like over many months in small 
pieces. And that's sort of the way it's gone organically with me. I have two sets of parents. My mother's married to my stepfather for 25 years and my father to my stepmother for the same amount of time, plus my in-laws. So there's three sets of parents and we've sort of had those conversations. By the way, my my father-in-law made it very clear that they had set up a trust to protect my husband's future inheritance from any (laughs) ex-wives. (laughs) <laughs> That's lovely. <laughs> you know, hey, everybody's got to be bulletproof, right? But it occurs to me, like, you might forget. It, you you can take notes, but you might want to audio record the conversation or even maybe video it so that nothing can be subject to the loss of memory or translation or anything like that. What do you think about that? I think that's a great idea. Anytime you can record and whether that's video or just on your phone, your phone probably has an app that allows you to record. And I would ask for permission before doing it. But technically, I guess you could just do it and write down the notes to have for your records. But in, for the most part, it's always best, really, no matter what kind of intense conversation you're having like that. And it could even be good for work conversations to be recording things so that doesn't get lost in translation. Right, right. And I mean, you have it in writing from your mom. So that's pretty much black and white. But yes, <laughs> yeah, okay. we know what to do. But plenty of people don't. And I do think it is a great idea to keep record of that somehow. Good. Erin, we're, thank you so much. It's great to chat with you again. And you've been found, you're always so articulate. It's very impressive. Where can people find you find out more about you and, and learn from you if they're interested? Well, first, thank you so much. That's very nice. But I would say first up going to my site, brokemillennial.com. If you misspell millennial in Google, don't worry, it'll still direct you to my site. (laughs) And Twitter, I'm at broke millennial on Instagram. I'm at broke millennial blog. And I also have a book coming out May 2nd. It's called broke millennial stop scraping by and get your financial life together, which is currently available for pre order on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Awesome. And we will link to all of those places at hillaryhendershot.com forward slash 63. Millennial is like a hard word to spell, isn't it? Yes. I even have to fact check it sometimes because I spell it so often. I'm like, oh, did I, did I misspell that? It's got two double consonants in the middle and it yes. never seems like it should. <laughs> and it's. I heard a good riff about saying like two L's, two N's. But then there's that extra L on the end. It's just very confusing. I would say the most common misspelling, though, is millennial with one N. Yeah. It does have two. (laughs) There you go. There you have it. Find out more at HillaryHendershot.com forward slash 63. That's Hillary with one L and Hendershot with two T's. Thank you so much for being here on a on a New York City Friday night, Erin. Well, thanks so much for having me. This is great. Profit Boss, do you hate getting unsolicited advice? I kind of do. Whether it's well-intentioned or not, any kind of splaining just feels, I don't know, sort of aggressive and unwelcome. Of course, when I see someone who's important to me and they're struggling, sometimes it's tough to bite my tongue and just be there for them. So it's kind of a conundrum, right? We aren't here to run our friends' lives, no matter how well-qualified we are to do it. On the other hand, if you discover something that's really made a difference to you, don't you just want to share it with everyone? I mean, it would be really presumptuous of me to just assume that my little podcast is something every listener just can't wait to share. But I do know what I hear from my listeners about how Profit Boss Radio has helped them to start changing old money habits and feel more in control and hopeful about getting out in front of their financial security. And I have to think that for every person I've reached, there are thousands more who might feel the same way if they get the chance. So if you're one of my listeners or in our Facebook group and you know at least one or two people in your social network could use an encouraging word, let me invite you to let them know about the podcast and about our Facebook group. Just hit the share button in your podcast app. It'll give you a good feeling, I promise. And you'll be helping me accomplish my big audacious goal of empowering a million women to take charge of their financial futures and become millionaires. Lastly, let me just say I'm truly honored to have earned a place in your busy schedule. I know you've got a lot of demands on your time and attention, and I'm so totally grateful for the little part of it that you share with me. So thank you, and let's get together next week for another episode of PBR. 
Thank you for listening to Profit Boss Radio, where creating success on our own terms happens every day. You're not alone in your journey to a rich life, and that's why Hillary is here to add value in each and every episode. See you next time on the podcast for women and money.